it's good to have y'all back. <laughs> I know Kay is excited, and she's been talking to me about this since last year, basically. <laughs> Uh, a few times, a few times. Well, we are glad that the choir is back, and it's, we're glad that, again, week by week, we're inching closer and closer back to the new normal uh, in many ways. And uh, for many of you, uh, starting to see y'all come back on a more regular basis brings joy to my heart, and to see each of you always brings joy to my heart. Well, this week, we are in the second week of our sermon series called Under Construction, where we are taking a look at what God is doing in the Old Testament. There are a lot of characters that we're going to dive into. There's a lot of characters that we are going to take a look at. But first and foremost, what we are looking at is what God is doing. Because that's why we are all here. We are all here to see what God is up to and to see how we can get involved in that very same thing. And so we are taking a look at all of this, and we're diving uh, back into the story in 1 Samuel. And so before we get started, I want to invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, we ask that you would speak to us this day. We ask that you would bring this scripture to life in a new way. And Lord, above all, call us the new possibilities that you are showing us. We ask this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So I want to do something a little differently today, and not just differently today, but different from the first service. We've got a long scripture text today, and I just want to go ahead and start with that scripture service, or scripture uh, passage. And, and sometimes what happens is I give a little bit of background, but instead I just want to read that with us, all of us together. And so Anthony will put those up on the screen. We're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 16 starting in verse 34. So this is what 1 Samuel says. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul. Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death, but Samuel grieved over Saul. And the Lord was sorry that he had made Saul king over Israel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to, him, to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? Samuel said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. He sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came... He looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but he's keeping the sheep right now. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil 
and anointed him in the presence of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this is what I want you to remember today in week two of our sermon series, Under Construction. God sees possibilities where others see problems. God sees possibilities where others see problems. So within 1 Samuel, there is a lot that is happening. The, first, the book of 1 Samuel is all about the story of David's rise to power. And many of us know who David is because David is one of the most famous scripture or famous scripture heroes that there is. This transcends all even the church world. It goes into the modern culture because you still hear this phrase called David and Goliath. And this David, well, is David that we read about here. So 1 Samuel is all about this rise to David's power to be king. But it wasn't an easy road. Because last week we started in 1 Samuel and we saw that the word of God was rare, that visions were seldom, yet God still called Samuel to do his work. And a few chapters later, the people began to stir a little bit more. They began to cry out because they wanted to be like everybody else. And all the other nations around them had this thing called a king. And they kept grumbling before God. They kept grumbling before Samuel. And eventually God relents and says, listen, we can try this experiment and you can pick your own king. And the king that they picked was this guy named Saul. Now Saul looked like a leader. He looked like a king. He came from a royal, a rich family with a lot of, with a great stature. He was this really tall guy and everybody looked up to him. He looked like a king and the people chose Saul to be their king. And everything worked out from here on out. Except for it didn't. Because Saul began to go after his own future. Became more concerned about his reputation. Became more concerned about his own power than God's future, than God's future for his people. The very reason why God agreed to have a king in the first place was so that this king would guide the people to his preferred future. But things didn't work out. And at the tail end of chapter 15, those last couple of verses that I just read, what we see is that Samuel is grieving over Saul. Grieving over the fact that now God has ripped Israel away from Saul's grasp and now Saul is no longer fit to be king. Even though that Saul was just the people's choice and not God's choice, still Samuel was grieving over all of this. So much so that God had to enter into Samuel's story and rouse him awake to say, how long will you grieve over this? How long will you grieve over the old ways? How long will you grieve over this failed project? Get up. I have provided myself a king this time. And so God sends Samuel to Bethlehem. God sends Samuel to Bethlehem to this place, or to this man named Jesse, who had eight sons. And he goes over here and he he says that he is going to sacrifice and invite all of this family to sacrifice with him. But what he's really going to do is to find the one that God has chosen to be king. Now, here's the ironic thing throughout this whole passage, is that the main point of this passage is not that Samuel gets up and does what God has asked him to. The main point of this passage is not the fact that David is anointed king. The main point of this passage is that God sees. God sees more than Samuel sees. God sees more than the people of Israel see. God sees more than the elders of Bethlehem see. Because when Samuel shows up and he invites Jesse's family to come forward, Samuel is there with Jesse's family, and the seven of Jesse's sons are there before him. And one by one, these sons pass before Jesse. 
And as, for, as soon as the first, the eldest son, the one that would have the right to be king, the one who has the right to the inheritance, passes before Samuel. Samuel, using the old logic, Samuel, using the old way, says, no need to see the others. We have found our king. He is tall. He has broad shoulders. He's handsome. He looks good. He looks like a king. Surely this is God's future king. And Samuel's all ready to anoint him as the future king of Israel when God intervenes and says, no, this isn't my king. Because mortals, because people look on outward appearances while God looks beyond those outward appearances and looks to the very heart. And so God rejected the eldest son of Jesse as king. Then the next son passed by. And once again, Samuel, now a little bit more attentive to what God was doing, says, this isn't God's son, or this isn't God's chosen one. Then the next one, and then the next one, and the next one. And after all seven passed by, Samuel goes and says, none of these are God's chosen one. Do you have anybody left? And Jesse says, well, there's the youngest but he's out in the field keeping the sheep. David wasn't even worthy to be invited to the sacrifice from the beginning. David was the one that was forgotten about. David was the one that was so far down the inheritance ladder that he didn't even matter. Yet Samuel, still looking for the king that God had provided himself, says, go, send him. And as soon as David walks in, the youngest son, the shepherd of them all, the one who's probably still smells and reeks of sheep, God looks at David and says, rise, this is the one that is my chosen king. From outward appearances, from outward standards, from the old standards, David had no business being king. But God sees more, God sees possibilities where others see problems. God saw more in David than the elders of Bethlehem did. God saw more in David than Samuel did. God saw more in David than even his own family. God sees possibilities where others only see problems. David was selected not for David's own good, but for the good of the people of Israel. That the people of Israel would be a God-honoring and a God-fearing people. That they would stay faithful to God. That they would stay faithful to the one that had brought them through so much And there would be times that David would fail. There would be times that David would make all of these mistakes, yet God still saw all of this, and God was determined to work through David. Because what was at stake was vital. What was at stake in this story was the future of the people of Israel. But not just that, but the future of all people. Because a couple hundred years later, in the same town of Bethlehem, in the same line of David the king, would come one who would be called the good shepherd, the one who would be called king, the one who would be called crucified, dead, and buried. God sees possibilities where others see problems. And through Jesus Christ's life, death, and resurrection, what we see are brand new possibilities that cannot even be contained by death itself. Our church is at a crossroads. Our church is at a place where as we begin to emerge from this COVID-19 pandemic, as we take steps one after the another to get back to normal, we have a choice. We can go back to the way things once were and grumble about the problems that we once had. 
where we can begin to see the possibilities that God wants us to see. This past week on Facebook, we had a neighbor of ours who flew their drone up in the air at sunset and took this picture of the church. Some of y'all saw this picture. Some of y'all shared this picture. Some of y'all commented on this picture. It's a beautiful and a wonderful picture. And it, it captures Sharon United Methodist Church in a great light. But it also, to me, could stand for what possibilities lie before us. Because when we sit in this building, when we drive up to the church week after week, when we regularly attend worship, sometimes it's easy to get into the, to the habits that we have always had to try to get back to normal and try to just do things the way that we have always done it. But now we have an opportunity to see new possibilities, to see the possibilities that God has for us. And so today, I want, you to, I want to invite you to take a look at this picture and to embrace the history that we have had, to embrace the 200-plus year history that we have, the legacy that we have, the history that we have. But I also want to ask you this, that as we look forward, as we commit ourselves to make disciples and to make a difference, what I want to ask is this. What do you see? What do you see? What possibilities do you see for this church? What opportunities have emerged in the last 15 months for our church? What new steps can we take to last another 200 years? Perhaps as you look at this picture, what you see are children piling out of the front of this church during vacation Bible school, running all around this church, having fun, having freedom, and knowing that they are loved and knowing that they are safe. And seeing before your very eyes life change taking place in some of these children's lives. Perhaps as you take a look at this building, you, you, you can imagine the downstairs room where the, there's that hallway and that wonderful mural. And instead of just seeing an empty hallway, what you can maybe see and even lit here in some ways is controlled chaos down there. With children in every room worshiping and learning the books of the Bible, learning what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Perhaps that's what you see. Perhaps. What you see as you look at this place is maybe students who begin to be our leaders, not just for one or two Sundays out of the year, but begin to start new ministries. That they don't worry about asking permission, but they go ahead and do it themselves. Why? Because they are called to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Perhaps that's what you see, that students, middle school and high school students' lives are changed because of our ministries. Perhaps what you see as you look at this picture, you can imagine the inside of this church and you imagine it filled with people responding to the tragedies of the world, the crises of the world, responding to the anxiety and the worry of the world and nonetheless standing tall and singing at the top of their lungs, joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Perhaps, that's what you see. Perhaps you see this as a mission outpost where we gather here on Sunday mornings, but we, we don't end on Sunday mornings, but Sunday mornings are just the beginning where we are sent out to be good news in our community, to invite others to join us on Sunday morning and to be the ministers of the gospel throughout the week. Certainly, as you look at this picture and think about this church, I, I'm certain that you can come up with problem number one, two, three, four, five. I am certain that you can. But where others see problems, God sees possibilities. In the name of the Father, Son, 
and Holy Spirit. Amen.